ready for another talk. There we go. Come on. So there we go. Let's get some energy. All right. So we have a hometown hero, Mandy Hubbard, who is a first-time DevOps speaker. So give her your full undivided attention. Give her some enthusiasm. And she's going to walk us through all the things QA. Good morning. I think it's still morning. I am Mandy Hubbard. I am a software engineer and a QA architect from Austin, Texas. I have been leading quality efforts for companies in Austin for almost 20 years. I've worked for different size companies and in industries ranging from fintech to big data to network management solutions. And I'm currently a software engineer at ShipEngine, where we integrate hundreds of shipping carriers and marketplaces, um, such as uh, Shopify and Magento and those sorts of things, uh, through our shipping APIs. I've always been very focused on quality. I can even remember back in college when I put in data validation in my C++ programs and was mad when I didn't get any extra points for that because my teacher didn't really think quality was all that important. But I've always been very focused on quality and that's kind of how I got into CICD. Um, so you see here on my speaker slides a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a developer advocate, not in the professional title sense, but in the philosophy. Um, I really like doing things to make developers' jobs easier. That means having automated tests that run so that they have um, some confidence about their code before they push it out. And that's um, also why I like building pipelines. So I'm not here pushing any product or service. I'm simply a geek girl who loves implementing solutions and sharing what I learned with other people. So I hope you find this useful. So today we're going to talk about kind of the way in which the software development landscape has changed during my career um, with the culmination of companies moving to microservices. And we'll talk about some of those promises of microservices that companies seek to achieve and what continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, what that looks like in a microservices world because it's a, a bit different. I'm going to walk you through all of the things I have done to try and scale agents and keep up with building microservices that eventually culminated into trying out Kubernetes. So if you only remember a few things today, it's that um, Jenkins is staying in front of technology so that it can, um, it can do all of the things that you're doing in your own software applications and that you need to take advantage of all of those things. But mostly I want, to, I want you to walk away knowing that you too can spin up a Jenkins environment in Kubernetes it is really, really very simple, and I hope after this talk you will be inspired to go out and try it. So, uh, how many people are already running Kubernetes? Awesome. And how many of you are running Jenkins? And who's running Jenkins on Kubernetes? All right. So, there's some interest here. You may have already done this, um, but I'm going to kind of hopefully bring people on board who aren't familiar with any of these technologies. So let's get started. So back in the day when I was first getting involved in, in QA, um, we usually had a monolithic application. I mean, a true monolith where everything ran on one server, either in a data center or somewhere in the back of our office or where have you. And it was pretty simple to build, test, and deploy software because it's one system. Um, usually everything's written in the same language and there's only one place to deploy and test. So it really simplified building and deploying and testing software. Moving forward, we started working on distributed applications. In this case, we took some of the components, maybe very large components, maybe your you know, identity management or your backend database were on separate physical or virtual servers, but still you had a very few pieces of infrastructure. Kind of complicated things, but it was still pretty simple compared to where we're moving today. But moving forward to microservices architecture, we're now talking about a lot of moving parts. We're talking about very small discrete services running, um, being scaled so that we have lots of infrastructure to keep up with and lots of things to deploy to. And it has changed the way that we build, test, and deploy software. How many of you have seen a slide like this before? Wow, not as many people as I thought. Well, most of the time when you go to these types of talks, there are people standing up here talking about all of the promises of microservices. We want to move to that architecture because we want to be able to deploy smaller changes independent of other 
pieces and be able to make frequent changes without affecting the entire application. It allows us to scale horizontally and we don't have to use the same language and tool set for all of our services because we have discrete services. These are all of the benefits that the microservices, um, people who tout microservices will claim, which is ultimately gonna re uh, reduce cost and reduce risk for your business. And I don't really know many business businesses that aren't interested in achieving these things. However, in order to achieve these, we need to take a look at our CICD pipeline. So I'm gonna show you kind of a, a diagram of continuous integration. In this example, I'm using Jenkins as my build and test platform. I'm a huge Jenkins fan, and I'm gonna be using um, GitHub as our source control management system. So in a continuous integration environment, if a developer needs to make a code change, whether it's to fix a bug or write a new feature, hmm, turn off the slack. Hey, you will not thwart me. Okay, when a developer gets ready to write new code, he or she is going to create a branch locally. Oh my goodness, y'all, I'm sorry. This is like speaking 101 that I totally forgot. It's my awesome coworkers. Why are we not closing down? Die slack, okay. All right, let's try it again. All right, so developers are gonna create a branch to do a bug fix or to create a new feature. And when that developer has code that's ready to go to production, they're gonna open a pull request, or a PR, as it's known in GitHub terminology. And that is an indication that they would like that code to be merged into the master branch. And the master branch is the pristine branch from which we always deploy. So in a really solid continuous integration environment, we're gonna have end-to-end -end communication between our source control management system, in this example, GitHub, and our build and deployment platform, which in this example is Jenkins. And this is achieved by using webhooks so that when something happens in our GitHub repository, such as the pull request being open, GitHub's going to send a notification to Jenkins via the webhook. Jenkins is then going to take action. Uh, it's going to check out the pull request, build it and test it, and send a status back to GitHub. And so this is where it gets into why CICD is important to me as a quality aficionado. Because while this is occurring, the screen in your pull request in GitHub, the GitHub UI, is going to be yellow. You can't, or no one can merge that to master until these quality checks have completed. No skirting around it, no pushing it anyway, no late night commits. It's not happening until the quality checks have passed. This is why I love CICD. So let's say all the tests pass. Um, the next thing that happens is your squash and merge button is now green. Once you click that button, that's going to send another notification to Jenkins that a push was um, done to the master branch. Now, the way we can construct our pipeline scripts in Jenkins, um, pipeline is just a build script written in Groovy that gives a set of instructions on how to build, test, and deploy your software. And we can write these scripts in a way that it can take, it can be conditional and take different actions, whether we're testing a pull request or testing a push to master. And so if all of the checks are, are um, successful, then we will deploy. And that gets into the difference in continuous delivery and continuous deployment, which is a whole separate talk um, we could get into. But continuous delivery simply means that we keep our master branch in a state that is ready to deploy at any time. Continuous deployment means we actually deploy every push to master immediately to production. And there are reasons why you might do one um, over the other, it, it really comes down to business rules and um, interdependence between different components um, and, and just risk aversion. So the reason I wanna go over this, um, I really believe that in order to deploy small changes regularly in our microservices architecture, that we must have continuous integration and continuous delivery at a minimum in place. But what this looks like now, we've got all of those services in the first picture with all the Bs, and we've got, with this setup, a minimum of two builds for pull request. We've got the first pull request, uh, the first build when the pull request is open, the second when the pull request is merged to master. So what I want to convey is that once we move to a microservices architecture and we're doing CI/CD, 
that really turns into a whole lot of builds. So now we've got to manage our build and deployment platform infrastructure to be able to keep up with this. So now, if you think about CI, CD, and the evolution of um, the way we build and deploy software, with a monolith, we could get away with maybe building everything on one master agent, and um, pretty much everything's in the same tool, the same languages, um, because we're deploying to one environment. So we, CI, CD is great there, but it's not really necessary. But as we evolve into distributed applications, things get a little bit more complicated, and we potentially are using different languages and tools, so we might have different needs for the different pieces of our application. So now CI, CD, uh, CI is getting very important in um, continuous delivery. It's still kind of optional, but it's, a, it's the right way to do things from a quality perspective. But once you move to microservices, it's no longer optional. You really must have continuous integration and continuous delivery. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to achieve all of the promises of microservices. You're not going to have the infrastructure capacity to release all those small changes regularly and keep up with that load. So at this point, we need to, to change things up. So how do we build, test, and deploy all of these small frequent changes in a scalable way? And the only way we can do that is that we must adopt a CI CD pipeline that's kind of tuned to optimize building these microservices. So now that gets me into all the ways that I've run Jenkins. Um, I want to walk you through kind of how I got started, some things I tried that finally convinced me to try running it on Kubernetes. So the first thing I did was I executed all my builds on master, even though all the docs say don't do that. We all do that, right? You set up a Jenkins system, um, you run all your builds, and everything's fine. You're building uh, maybe one or more services, but then things get complicated once you start building more services. And you realize you really do need a build agent. So then that usually looks like setting up one agent that um, maybe an EC2 instance or a physical server if you've got that, and you just put all the tools you need. You put all the languages and all the tool sets, and then you can build any of your services. And whenever you want to scale it, you just stamp out another one until you've got enough agents to keep up with your load. But of course, you, you know, you've got, sometimes you're using all your agents, sometimes you're using a few of your agents, and you're not really maximizing efficiency and cost. And management really doesn't like that. Also, you've got to keep them all updated with your, you know, all your different software packages. And it's a lot to maintain. So then I thought, well, why don't I just create a different agent for all of the things I'm building? Because let's say I had like a, a node application and also a Go application. And so I had one agent that just did the Go builds and one that just did the node builds. So that's simplified it. I've got one agent per platform. And I don't have to worry about uh, updating Go on both of the agents or updating Python on both of the agents. It's super simple. But now you're really dealing with idle agents because your agents are specialized and can only build for the language and tool set that is installed. And so that doesn't really work for optimizing cost and efficiency. So the next thing I did was I tried dockerizing agents. I tried several ways. The first thing I did um, was Docker and Docker, where you're running the Docker machine inside your ephemeral agent. So you've got an agent running as um, in a Docker container, and then you want to build and push other Docker images inside of that container. So you install Docker and Docker. And then I read about the security risk of that, and I did it again, and I mounted the Docker host um, of the Jenkins master inside my agent containers so that I could build um, like sidecar containers for my actual application. And then I tried running with an external Docker host that all it did was I um, set all my workload there. I just needed a Docker client on my agent, and all the work was handled on the external Docker host. Um, but you still got a lot of um, idle, idle resources. And then uh, finally, I tried, well, what if I just spin up a Docker host when I need it? And so I actually had the EC2 plugin spin up um, a Docker host on an EC2 agent and then launch Dockerized agents on top of that EC2 host and then build Docker containers. You can see I've tried a lot of different things. So finally, I said, sure, fine, let's, let's try Kubernetes. I wanted to learn Kubernetes. I was already familiar with Jenkins, so I think if you're trying to learn a new technology, it really helps if 
you do it in kind of the context of something you're already familiar with. So I thought this is a great way for me to get familiar with Kubernetes concepts. I tried reading the docs and um, didn't found it really dry and boring. But once I was trying to install my very favorite CI/CD platform in Kubernetes, things got really interesting. And that is how, um, how I approach kind of getting more familiar with Kubernetes. So for those of you who aren't familiar, such as I was when I started, I just want to hit a few key concepts that kind of put it all together for me. <coughs> and the first is the concept of a node, which is a physical or virtual server that contains all of the um, discrete application components that provide the Kubernetes platform. The next thing is a cluster. That's going to be one or more nodes so that you can spread out the workload across those nodes. Um, and then your application is going to be defined in a pod. That's kind of the building block or the smallest unit of work in Kubernetes. Usually consists of one or more containers that kind of live and die together. They share resources such as networking um, and um, storage. Most of the time you're going to have one container per pod because that's kind of how we're architecting our services for scalability, but you might have two if they're tightly coupled. Then we need to expose that pod to the world. We need to be able to have a publicly accessible IP address for our service, and that's defined in the service definition. And then the final piece is the idea of a Helm chart. Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, if you think about like running APK or like Chocolatey or Brew or any of your favorite package managers on your laptop, um, it's the same kind of thing. It's a way to install applications written for deployment into Kubernetes. It's e a way to easily install them. And then a chart is kind of the packaging format for Helm. OK, so with that background, let's um, Let's, I'm going to take you over to the, oh, I thought we figured this out. Got it. OK. I want to take you through, just briefly, this is the official Helm chart for Jenkins. And you've got a bunch of templates here. If you're already familiar with Kubernetes, you probably are familiar with defining things um, with YAML and variables. But they're all parameterized or templatized here for the various aspects. And then you simply have a values.yaml, or you can override various things. So I wanted to show you just how configurable and extensible your Jenkins instance can be. Is this exciting or overwhelming to see all of this? Like, for me, it's completely overwhelming because I didn't know what a lot of these things meant. And I just wanted to get up and I'm still going. OK. So there's a lot of things you can do to customize. But if you go to the chart and you see that and you think, wow, I don't really want to deal with all that, don't, don't freak out because oh, that's awesome. Typically, um, it comes with a set of sane defaults. And this is a values.yaml that I used. It came from. A tutorial example I use to kind of get things up and running. And so you, even though you can extend and customize to your heart's content, you don't have to understand that to just get started. So this is an, ex an example values.yaml just to override the things um, that I care about when I do my installation. So before I installed Jenkins using Helm, there were a few things that I needed to do. Um, I did this in GKE. I'd never used GKE before. But I just started looking around, and their tutorials are amazing. Um, I met Victor Iglesias at Jenkins World, and he, he gave a talk similar uh, on running on Kubernetes. And I found all of his tutorials, and they're super easy to consume. Uh, and I use that to do all the prereqs for installing Jenkins. So I've got a link to one here that you can visit to get set up. It's, it looks like a lot of you probably are already at this point, and that's awesome. But once you have your environment set up, you've got your cluster and you've got your access configured and Helm is all set up to go, then all you have to do is run a Helm install. And you can see here that I have indicated that I'd like to use the, the stable Jenkins, which is the repo we just looked at. I want to override with the values.yaml that we just looked at. And um, there's a couple other options that you give. 
And then you kick that off, and you're going to end up with a working Jenkins master. You can obtain the admin password from the G Cloud console really easily. So by the time this is all done, you can obtain that password, and you're ready to log in as admin and start using Jenkins. So I want to walk you through the specific installations required in Jenkins once you get it up and running. So this kind of goes through. You're going to need a credential set for your cluster so that the Jenkins master has permission to launch agents inside that cluster. You're going to need to configure, uh, create a cloud configuration for that cluster so that Jenkins master knows where to launch your agents. We're then going to create a pod template for the agent, which defines uh, which containers are going to be available inside that agent, and then we will create a container template for each of those. So um, I'm just going to show you some screenshots of the configuration. So to create the account that Jenkins is going to use to authorize it to create agents in Kubernetes is um, the Kubernetes service account. And I'm going to show you all the things that you have to configure, but if you use the Helm chart with those default values that YAML override, you really don't have to configure all of this. It's already pre-configured. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, you'd have to go and do this. So now we've got an account that Jenkins can use to create agents in the Kubernetes cluster. We configure the Kubernetes cloud so the master knows where to launch the new agents. And you can see that you've got you know, different things that you can configure here, but you don't really have to configure all of them. So it gets interesting when we configure our pod template. So the pod template is going to kind of define what is inside the pod that acts as your agent. So I've given it a name and a label. If you've used external Jenkins agents before, you're familiar with specifying a label so that you can refer to it later. And then we can give environment variables, we can mount volumes, um, we can set the retention, and all of the things you would want to control the behavior of that agent right here in the UI. And then if you click the Add Container button, you'll get this screen. And this is where you're going to add the containers that you want to be available inside that pod. So that once you decide to build on that pod, it's going to launch an instance, and you can say, do this action inside my Golang container, do this action inside my, um, you know, the Docker client container. So this is all well and good, but how do we use it? From your Jenkins file, of course. So just like with your external agents, you specify the node by name. You can use all of your regular um, plugin syntax. This is using um, one of the plugins. You just say, check out SCM. And then you, once you're inside your, uh, your build steps, then you can indicate which container in which to build each of the steps inside of your pipeline. And then once you do a build, you'll see I did this twice, and I purposely wanted to show you that it launches a brand new pod every time you run a build. So it's a brand new pristine environment. If you're not running builds, you're not paying the cost of, of um, having those running all the time. Now, one of the one of the configuration options that you can set, if, if you're running builds back to back and you don't want to incur the cost of spinning up that pod every time, you can set it to say, um, I don't know, wait 15 minutes for a new build before shutting down this pod. So you have some configuration options there. But I just wanted to show you how it spins up a brand new pod with each build. So I don't like configuring things in the UI because it's not software defined and I have to remember to back up Jenkins and a whole lot of other things. So I wanted to show you next how you can do all of the UI work in, directly in your Jenkins file. So in this example at the top, I've got the pod template information with the two containers, just like we did in the UI. I'm mounting a volume here. And you remember there are quite a lot of options in the UI. You can specify those options here, any of the ones you want to tweak, or you can only override the ones that you care about, and so it's very simple. And then you just, just like with the other, you specify the agent by name, you specify the container in which you want to run particular steps. And the way I set this one up, um, and one other disclaimer, I, I had to make this work before I was willing to talk about it because that's just kind of how I'm wired. The first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to do my builds exactly the way I was accustomed to doing them, which was 
using a Docker client and a Docker engine to do my Docker build and my Docker push. So um, I mounted that Docker socket and then I used the Docker container, which just had the client, so that I could run all of my Docker commands with just wrapped in an, uh, a shell command. But then I kind of started reading and learned. Um, I can also just use the G Cloud CLI. Uh, I can just specify a container that has that installed. So any of your cloud providers should have a CI CLI available. Whatever you're using from your local machine and Azure, AWS, you should be able to find or build a Docker image that has those tools so you can do it exactly in your Jenkins pipeline as you're doing it in your local environment. So I want to show you one other way you can define these. If you already are a Kubernetes aficionado and you really love YAML, you can define everything in YAML directly in your Jenkins file. I don't know why you want to do it, but a lot of people are comfortable with that, and you can also do it there. So um, I also, though, when you're first starting, even though ultimately it's great to have everything software defined and in your source control management system, don't be afraid just to configure it through the UI, get it working, and then understand it. I probably spent, it took about an hour, maybe two, to get this up and running, and then I spent the good part of a weekend to go back and understand what I'd just done. So I kind of think that that solution first, dig in second approach, it works really well for me. So don't be afraid to take whatever shortcuts you need to get it running, because once you see it running, it's, it's way more motivating to go and understand what's going on than when you don't know if it's going to work or not. So final thoughts here. Um, as I said, Jenkins is growing to take advantage of new technology and to enable you to build applications using new technology. You really want to take advantage of all of Jenkins' capabilities. If you're still using the same Jenkins that you started with five years ago, you're missing out. But mainly, as I said, um, I don't work for Jenkins, I don't work for Kubernetes, I just like tech and I want to share what I learned in my, um, my time using Jenkins. Um, and I just want you to walk out of here knowing that you also can totally spin this up and um, get an environment running and then if you're not using this in your, um, in your company, you can easily demo and do a POC and say, hey, why are we not doing this? It was super easy. So that's it. Um, what are your questions? I know we don't have much time before lunch, so you're probably not um, you're probably not a captive audience when you're trying to go to lunch. But I'll take a few questions now, but also know that I'm going to be around today and tomorrow. You can find me on Twitter, and if you want to meet up and chat and talk CICD or quality or anything, um, I would love to meet you. So thanks for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Are there any questions for now? What are your questions? Are Raise you too your hungry? hands. I'll come around. No. No questions. Wow. All I told right. you they're going to be too hungry. You must have done he a really good he, job. Can, he told me he controlled lunch, so he won't serve until we're done. Should we I let am, him go I'm, eat? I am the, yeah, we can go eat. So lunch is served right out these uh, drapes, I guess, over to your, to your over to my left, your right, or your back. <laughs> Uh, go grab them. Uh, feel free to sit outside in the stadium, enjoy the view of the Jumbotron, and we'll be back after lunch for more content.